Welcome back. You're watching tonight as we continue this conversation with the Salaries and Remuneration Commission Chairperson, Len Mengich. Uh, thank you for staying with us. <clears throat> and before we took a break from the conversation, we were talking about uh, the changing um, structure, or is it the policy on some allowances? There are those that uh, have been scrapped, including those that go to retreats, task mm. force, or internal committees. Mm -hmm. And of course, the uh, rationalizing uh, the DSA that <coughs> is um, uh, meant for uh, persons uh, traveling maybe out of station. Uh, first of all, you're saying that it amounts to double compensation for workers. Maybe you can explain that uh, for us, but also the rationale and what this means, especially in affecting uh, the public wage bill. All right, let, let me begin with the ones that we are saying amounts to double compensation, mm -hmm. which, which have you rightly mentioned, it is the retreat allowance. Um, it, it is the task force allowance. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you look at those ones, what happens is they are constituted to discharge a role that is already supposed to be discharged by the institution, mm -hmm. plus in, in, uh, the, the internal committees. So if I pick, for example, an internal committee or a task force, so you, you, you're setting up a committee to discharge a mandate that already you're supposed to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. So this happens normally whenever there is probably a, a project within the organization or something that requires people to work together as a team. Right. right? So because you need to work together as a team, then in some instances, then a, 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 an internal committee is formed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, or you then set up a task force. But because it is the mandate of that institution, then someone should have been assigned to that job, mm -hmm. right? And that's why we're saying it, is, it amounts to double compensation because if I call you to, to, to be in a committee, say for example it is a, a, a procurement committee or, or it's, a, it's a committee to recruit staff, that's already part of someone's job, right? right? Now, retreat allowance is typically these are, um, so you meet outside and mostly it's out of the organization to write policies, because that is what it's meant for. But remember, drafting policies is already a job of someone. Mm -hmm. so, so now when you're out there, then you're paid a retreat allowance to do policies out of the office. But surely that policy must be the responsibility of someone within that organization. So, and we are not saying this out of assumptions because we go through job descriptions, right? When we're evaluating jobs. So, so we're able to see that there are jobs whose responsibility is to draft policies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the fact that you're, you're now um, convening outside the office, there's no reason to be paid a retreat allowance. Even when sometimes that is an additional task, it's not your daily job. You've just been called to make a contribution in something new that is coming to the organization. Yes, but w w the, uh, even that, you do not, uh, there's no reason to compensate again. Because this is part of um, what every organization does. Even if you went to private sector, they don't, comp they don't compensate. Why? If you are being called to contribute, you are contributing by virtue of your role, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're not contributing outside your normal role. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so is that what it means when you say any other role that may be assigned by yourself? That is Why part is of it as well. Right. For sure, that is part of it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about um, the daily subsistence allowances that are paid to staff when they travel out of town, uh, Sometimes it's not out of town, it's just out of station. So first of all, tell us the reasoning behind that you're limiting this to something that is beyond 50 kilometer radius. Has there been abuse or why? 50 kilometer radius is your, your, your normal duty station. So the purpose of being very specific is because uh, in the previous circular, it was left to, to where I can claim um, daily subsistence allowance, even at a distance, I can actually just commute and come back, mm -hmm. right? So that is why we've put that 50 kilometer radius. But you will see the main change is actually not that. The main change is the standardization mm -hmm. of allowance across the country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, and tell me about that because now we see that um, you, you think it's, it's been standardized, but the range is still between 4,200 and 18,200 shillings per day based on your level, your job group. Uh, but 
how different is it, um, especially when you look at the different cities and different towns that now this is going to solve? Per grade, so they, you're right in saying that there's a differentiation per grade. The standardization is because we had a rate for cities, we had a, a rate for municipalities, and then other towns. Mm -hmm. So that ended up with um, a, a DSA depending on where you're, you know, you're holding your meeting or your conference. Mm -hmm. And the tendency then was everybody converging on cities because cities pay the highest uh, DSA. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is, is that we spend an, a lot of money on travel, wasting time, because everybody's traveling to the farthest, to the cities, right? So you find people in Western Kenya all going to Mombasa, those in Mombasa coming to Nairobi and vice versa. So you might then find that in terms of the actual saving, it is going to come largely from the travel and the time that we waste going to the farthest location when you could just have your meetings, your conferences at the nearest uh, uh, conference facility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so this means if you come, say, from Busia County and you want to have a retreat, you can actually go to Kakamega instead of uh, yes. Mombasa. Yes. Uh, but, but then how practical will that be? Because sometimes you find a tendency of workers in public service going for that out of office uh, conference or workshop, or whatever it is, uh, the cost, for instance, or Naivasha or Nakuru is preferred because there's that element of easy time or holidaying. So that may not necessarily be solved. It will resolve most of it. Because most of the time, the reason why people go to cities is not because it is a luxury. Mm -hmm. It is because of the DSA. Remember, um, we give you the money, you decide where you want to stay. Um, and you find that there's a, there's a tendency to go for very expensive destinations, but actually you're not going to spend that amount. You're mm -hmm. not going to book yourself in a hotel of that 18,000. You're probably been spending yourself a hotel of worth less than half that amount. Mm -hmm. So it tends more to be an opportunity to save money out of the travel. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so, so, so that, that, that's, that's the way it works. It's not that people are going for a luxury hotel necessarily. It's just how much, you know, because you, you've got the, the leeway to decide where you stay. Yeah. And how much of a challenge is it? Because I think uh, some time earlier this year, I had seen some um, staff from Nakuru County coming to do a conference or some training here in Nairobi, uh, yet there could actually be better facilities within Nakuru County. How much of a challenge is that, um, especially uh, to justify expenditure? Now, the way we see it is not going to necessarily uh, reduce the amount of money being spent on DSA because the tendency normally is that budget will be exhausted anyway, mm -hmm. right? So by opening it up, you're allowing, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you're allowing public officers to actually have those conferences nearer their mm -hmm. workstations than traveling far distances. But in terms of the DSA itself, will we find savings? Probably not, because it will still be spent. Okay. So, so, so it is the hidden costs right. that, that will come in. Mm. Um, do, do you have an estimate of how much that would be? No, actually, we don't have at the moment, but it, we will be analyzing from the time we actually, we had some, so we will be analyzing to see what that will look like. Okay, yeah. all right, and shortly we'll be looking at, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the feedback that has been coming to us. But I wanted to ask you this question about uh, members of the county assembly, because they have been up in arms past few months against your institution. Them saying that when they compare themselves against the members of parliament, that is uh, the Senate and the National Assembly, they sort of feel that, they are, yes, their jobs are slightly different, but the description is almost similar in as far as legislation representation of the people in oversight. Um, but in this review, the increment, even across two years, is just about 20,000 shillings. How do you explain uh, this slow increase of salaries for MCAs? Uh, first, let me put it that it is not just about an MCA. Remember, these salaries, is um, the increase is also based on your grades, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you look at the state officers, at the, t at the top level, 
the, the higher grades, the increase is 4%, mm -hmm. right? For the MCAs, it is actually almost double that. Mm -hmm. So they, they got a higher percentage than the senior, mm -hmm. because that is the principle we applied across board, that you have lower percentage at the top and uh, slightly higher. The, the in absolute terms, it's yes. still small. Yes, because that is, that is the worth of the job. Remember, mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, we do carry out job evaluation. That job evaluation speaks to the relative worth of the job. Right. So once you assign a worth which determines the grade, then the grade obviously then determines mm -hmm. the pay. Mm -hmm. Now, there are other public officers, the same grade as, as, as an MCA. Right. So there is no discrimination whatsoever. It is just that that is, that is the, the pay okay. that is commensurate to that grade. Okay, all right. So for you, at the moment, that job is worth 154,000 for the current financial year. It is more than that because there is committee sitting allowances which okay. you have not added. Okay. So okay. you need you need to add another 64,000. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. All, all right. Of course, you're right about uh, those other additional uh, benefits. I want us to reflect a bit of uh, a bit of um, what members of the National Assembly and the Senate are getting in terms of uh, benefits. Apart from their pay, they have something called motor vehicle reimbursement of 7.55 million shillings, which is payable once, right? No, that is that is mileage claim. A mileage claim, the one you're... Okay, l let me just go through this and then we can yes, have a conversation. you can go through that. Then oh, car maintenance uh, allowance uh, okay. of 356,000 shillings yes. per month. Uh, current mileage claim, or mileage claim had been 116 shillings per kilometer, but now has been amended mm. to 152.6 shillings per kilometer. Let's see how it looks when you go to different constituencies and starting with Moyale constituency, which is a constituency in Marsabit County. It is 778 kilometers from a parliament building. So mm. double that if you are to do a round trip, that comes to 1,556 uh, 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 kilometers rather. So the claim per trip would be, if you had to use the new figure, it would be 237,000 shillings. For four weeks, if that member of parliament travels every week, that would be 949,000 shillings. For 52 weeks, that would be 12.3 million shillings. Of course, the previous maximum was 9.4 million shillings. And let's, let's hold it there, because if you had to look at uh, the benefits that members of parliament are getting, uh, slightly over 700,000 shillings. If you had to add um, car maintenance allowance, then a member of parliament is coming from Moyale, uh, for instance, uh, that mileage claim. It looks like it ends up being quite a lot of money, sometimes even higher than the state officers or the executive, uh, some of them. But how do you regulate this mileage claim, especially when you know that they do not necessarily travel every week? Our, our mandate is to set the rate, right? Um, it is then administered by the Parliamentary Service Commission. Mm -hmm. So the role of now, ascertaining whether you actually traveled, how much you should be paid, that actually is not the commission, that is Parliamentary Service Commission. Mm -hmm. But remember that this mileage is not a salary. It is a facilitation mm -hmm. because it is purely saying that you are required by the constitution, by law, to travel once a week. You, you know, as part of your representation role. Right. So you have to be facilitated to do that. So that should not be looked at as, as remuneration per se. Mm. It is purely just facilitating the member of parliament. And yes, you picked the, the farthest, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but most of them are not the, the farthest. But, but let me ask you, if you had to take that case example of uh, Moyale, yeah. would it really cost 237,000 to go home and come back uh, to meet a constituents? Remember, when you talk about reimbursement, um, it's not just about the fuel. Uh -huh. um, we use the base as the AA. If you, if you looked at AA rates, mm -hmm. and it will actually, you'll see in AA rates, it's a buildup of the cost. Remember, this is your personal car. This is your car. It's not, it's not an official car. Mm. So it has a buildup of, of uh, maintenance of the car, the tear and wear. It has, uh, so it takes a lot of the components for a car. Mm -hmm and then comes up with a mileage rate, 
right? So in fact, what we have today that you see there is actually not even the current AA rates because we can't afford to use mm -hmm. the current AA rates, right? But, 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 but Chair, the same member of parliament has a car maintenance allowance of 356,000 shillings per month. That, that, that one is for their, their, their commuting within Nairobi within, uh, for the entire month. So remember, and I want to give you an example of a state officer who is given a car, right? They have a driver, the car is fueled, it is maintained, all their expenses are, are, are actually paid for. Mm -hmm. Now for the time that the member of parliament is actually operating within Nairobi, uh, because that is where they will be and they only travel once a week, that, 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 that allowance is actually meant to pay for their day-to-day -day within their workstation. So this is to pay what for what? The car maintenance allowance? See, I've, I've given you an example of yeah. where you're given a car, right? So a, an equivalent state officer mm -hmm. who is not a member of parliament is given a car. Mm -hmm. That car is fueled, maintained by government. Mm -hmm. So that amount that you're seeing of 300 actually takes the cost of if we were not, if, if, you, if we were giving you a car. Now, a car is not just fuel, it is actually the fuel, it is maintenance, it's depreciation, it is the capital cost. So it is in lieu of a car. Does it pay for the driver? The 300 and... Yeah. No, no, no. Then don't you think that's double payment? Because the same car will go to Moyale and be reimbursed for the same. What happens is the car is not uh, paid, they, they, they get an allowance from Parliamentary Service Commission, which is facilitation. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a driver paid by government. No, no, I, I get you on that. Yes. I'm just asking because monthly they'll receive the 356,000 yes. shillings, everyone, yes. every member of parliament, yes. uh, for maintaining that car. No, not just maintaining for fueling, and also fueling running it within, it, Nairobi. Yeah, yeah, within Nairobi. But the same car will go to Moyale and be paid for the same. Apart from fuel, there's the maintenance, depreciation, wear and tear. When it comes to mileage claim, because now that's compensating you from Nairobi to wherever you are going, isn't it? Right. And as I mentioned earlier, that is actually based on the formula. If you are to access the, the AA, mm -hmm. and you will see how mileage is computed, it is, it's a scientific formula that is acceptable as an AA rate. So it's, okay. not, it's not something that the commission created. Sure. And as I said, if you actually to look at that, we can't even afford to use the current AA rates. We don't. Mm -hmm. So it is actually much lower because that is what we can afford. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. So let's take a look at the feedback, feedback that has come to us uh, via Twitter and other uh, platforms just to raise some questions with the chairperson here. Um, this is uh, Babu Michael, you're saying that uh, after the now salaries review uh, by SRC, which have been long overdue, I asked myself who will review the salaries of workers in the private sector who are at the mercy of their specific employers. What can they do to bring equality because of the, eco the economy is one? Uh, well, SRC is for the public sector, but I will wait to hear what her comment is. Um, Anonymous, ask SRC chair, why does SRC freeze local and national CBAs and tell universities they are not able to pay and yet she does not include us in the categories? This is unfair. Do you have a specific answer to that? Well, now, remember public universities, um, they now have a new funding model, mm -hmm. which I'm sure everyone understands. Mm -hmm. Now, prior to that, and I'll use all other state corporations, it's not just public universities. Mm -hmm. Before we advise on any CBA, the first thing we ask is, can you afford? Mm -hmm. Remember, one of the principles is affordability and fiscal sustainability. So we must look at your financials, mm -hmm. right? So we, we look at, we go through your financial statements in detail, and we ask that question, can you afford? If you cannot afford, and it's not just universities, you cannot then talk about increasing salaries in any way or form. Okay. So the same way when it comes to the universities, for the last few years, um, their, financial, uh, their financial statement just demonstrates that they can't meet any, mm -hmm. any increase at all, mm -hmm. right? So the universities, and it's not all of them, there are a few where we've actually approved one or two uh, increases. Okay. But by and large, the issue has been the ability of the universities 
to pay for that increase. So in those universities you have recommended approval, I mean you have approved uh, the raise, they can afford? And this is, the, the ones we have, universities have two collective bargaining mm -hmm. agreements. There is one that is signed for everybody, which is about basic salaries. Mm -hmm. Then there are, there are those they are calling local CBAs. In mm -hmm. the local CBA, each university now pays for their allowances. Okay. Now those are the ones that we have approved a few by exception. Right. But the general CBA that cuts across all of them, mm -hmm. um, they are, it has now just come up for, for us to advise. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we will look at ability to pay. Now, when it comes to the, the, the overall CBA, the general one, government would, would actually chip in. Okay. But we now have a new funding model, mm. and we know what it says. Okay. Right. We'll, we'll let us see the impact of that. Of course, there are various concerns about uh, uh, parents getting to understand it and the implication that will be for them and the learners. Let's take a look at another one. This is Chariot you're asking. Kindly, Uliza uh, Chair, Kama Ile Task Force Yamaraga, Co Policy, uh, whether she will consider it. Uh, I, I think he, he's talking about, um, yeah. uh, because there's an ongoing process, yeah. uh, the Justice David Maraga Task Force. Mm. What, if they come up with recommendations to raise or improve the salaries for uh, the police officers, how would that be processed by SRC? So it will come to SRC as a proposal. Um, and once we receive that proposal, it is very clear for us that we have to go through the pay principles that I said are very clear in the Constitution, mm -hmm. and we, we go through that process. So, yes, it will come to SRC as a proposal, then right. we, we review. Okay. Yeah. All right. S someone else, um, again, is saying, this is Dennis Kip uh, Kipkoech, yes. What happens to commuter allowance given the inflation in transport uh, cost? And I think you can tie this with them. You see state officers are either facilitated or reimbursed for whatever they spend, but, um, uh, and actually there's that review to the mileage, um, which can explain why. Uh, but now the rest of the public service, they're not necessarily getting a raise on commuter allowance despite the spiking cost of fuel in transport. It really boils down to we do not have money to pay for it, right? Um, and, and, and it goes back to, can the country afford? Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, a lot of people have asked, why are we even considering a review, mm -hmm. given where the economy is today? Uh, and we've said that, you know, and, and the National Treasury was there yesterday, and they, they explained quite a lot about this. Right. But basically, we're saying that the fact that there is no review on commuter is not because we would not want to review. Mm -hmm. It's just that the realities of the economic situation is that we can't afford to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, all right. As, let's take another question uh, from one of our uh, viewers uh, this evening. This is Josea. You're saying that is the review inclusive of annual increment? Uh, those um, employees whose basic salary are below 35,000 have nothing to smile about given the 1.5% housing levy and NSSF and NHIF increased deductions. Um, of course, the chair said that um, it is inclusive of the 3% um, increment. We'll get an answer for that. Let's take a look at another one. And this is Gideon. Is it logical to give one, a salary increment of 1,000 and another 33,000, and these people go to the same shop? Maybe we can take those two. Um, the rising rates of NSSF, NHF, housing levy and everything uh, versus um, this, uh, this raise. So eventually the public officers may feel demoralized that it is not working out because of the cost of living. What do you tell them, despite knowing that we cannot afford, as you say, but what do you tell them? Because it's knocked off, the raise is knocked off by the cost of living. I think the first thing is, is, is to appreciate that the NSSF, NHIF, housing levy is going to impact everybody, whether you're in the public sector or you're not. Mm. Um, at least for the public sector, there is a race, mm -hmm. which might question, although that was not the reason why we, we, we went through the review. Um, so, so the fact that it is happening means that there will be an element of cushion. But you know, deductions will happen to everybody. And some employers 
actually have not increased that pay at all, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, deductions are for, for a good reason and, and it's an obligation for, for all of us. Right. Yeah. Let's take another question. This is uh, from uh, Janet. You're saying the support staff and cleric officers in public service are paid 13,000 shillings and 16,000 shillings respectively. Don't you think this is unfair under current circumstances? What is SRC doing to address this unfair treatment of junior civil uh, servants? What do you say? The, the pay was reviewed for everybody, including the category that uh, is being mentioned here. Mm -hmm. And there is no pay that is lower than 15,000 mm -hmm. because we ensured that uh, no pay is below the minimum wage. Mm. Yes, so, so that cadre will definitely be moved to that level. Okay. Yeah. Only that in absolute terms, the impact is minimal. Um, another one, um, let's see, this is Steven. You're saying that uh, why is it the 10% rule is not applied to the National Police Service and KDF? The gap between the juniors and their bosses is very high. Um, let's see, this is Ali. Let the chairperson be honest, bearing in mind that the government has introduced the Finance Act, uh, super remuneration, uh, NSSF, and the government has gone further by deducting the newly introduced uh, tax on uh, gross and increasing basic salary. Where's the logic here? Okay, I think you have answered that. But there's that, that, that um, earlier part, I don't know what you have to say about it. Which, which, which earlier part? There's the earlier question that we just t took about the National Police Service and KDF and the differences between senior officers and the junior officers because uh, that dissatisfaction, that uh, the gap is so far apart, yet you're exposed to the same economy. You know, the, the issue about the gap, and I don't want to say it is just restricted to KDF or everyone else, mm. is that, as I, as I explained earlier, um, there, are, there, there is the worth of the job that you have to remunerate. Mm -hmm. So every job is graded. And therefore, that differential is not just restricted to one sector of the public service. Mm -hmm. All jobs are graded from you know, um, the lowest level to the highest. And uh, each has its own pay that reflects the worth of the job that the individual uh, does. Right. Yes. Okay. I interesting. Now, uh, there was that question. I know it doesn't. Uh, your commission doesn't deal with the public sector. I mean, the private sector. But what would be your say? Because that viewer was saying that there are no increments happening in uh, the private sector. What do you say? I, I think it's not. Uh, that, that's generalizing, because some private sector are actually increasing pay. As um, when, we, 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 when we undertook the survey, it mm -hmm. was clear that the commission, as I said, is just only targeting to be 58 percentile, which means that there are employers there who are paying way, way above what the public sector is paying. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, there are some private sector employers that are increasing pay. But if an employer does not increase pay, it must be for a good reason. Right. Because every employer would desire to be able to attract and retain skills, mm -hmm. right? Um, but again, everybody is subject to, can I afford? And even private sector, it is the same story. Can I afford? And if mm -hmm. you can't afford, well, then you can't increase pay. Okay. Yeah. And finally, on the public wage bill, currently you say it's 1.1 trillion uh, shillings. And of course, the reviews are recommended so that uh, as long as there's availability of resources, that happens. But are we doing so well, especially when you see transitions of power in the counties and the national government? How, does, how do the transitions affect uh, the wage bill and especially the workforce that we have? So let me begin by saying the trajectory, as um, you've rightly said, is been, uh, it's been coming down, right? We started in 2017 with, with a, just about 51%. That is wage bill to revenue. It's now come down to about 43, projected to go to 40%, 40, 40 again as the target of 35%. Mm -hmm. So what informs that wage bill? One is obviously the number of employees that we recruit. Um, and part of that number mm -hmm. is a number that speaks to the necessity for us to increase services, 
to reach their citizens. Specifically, you, that bigger, the bigger number is explained by increasing teachers, increasing the healthcare, and increasing security. Mm -hmm. And that is reflective of a, a developing country such as ours. So in developing countries, we will continue recruiting. In Kenya, we are still below the, 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 the international ratio for pupil to, um, uh, to teacher to pupils, mm -hmm. or healthcare worker to population, security to population. All this is, is saying that we still must continue recruiting. Right. And therefore, the wage bill in absolute amount will continue to increase. But what we worry about is that ratio to revenue. Right. Which means that we therefore must watch so that we, we are able to increase revenue as we also increase the services to reach the citizens. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a fair balance. But having said that, it does not mean that, um, going back to your question of county governments during the transition, yes, we've seen during the transition this recruitment, which then one will question, is that really recruitment in the essential services? And the answer is not always, right? There is recruitment that you can actually attribute to um, what you might say it is not necessarily reflective of the critical needs mm -hmm. of the county, right? But they tend to be more political than anything else. Mm -hmm. So basically it's saying that, yes, there is numbers, there is the good numbers, which we cannot complain about, but there is also the need for us to be able to see how to to optimize, to ensure that we are not recruiting in the areas that we should not be recruiting. Do you have any role, especially if you see that, um, as you call it, political, may I add political rewards, mm. do you have any role in limiting how far that goes? We don't have a direct role because the County Public Service Board has the mandate to establish positions. Mm -hmm. And at the national government, the employing entity also has that mandate. Our role comes at the point of saying the wage bill now has reached a proportion that we need to look at. So we don't have a direct role, but we have an indirect role because it's a wage bill concern. But then it means it is one of those things that we would have, to, we, have to, we must work closely okay. uh, with other stakeholders mm -hmm. to reach, to come up with a solution. Okay. Yes. All right. Let me engage the chairperson of the Salaries and Remuneration Commission. Thank you so much for your time to have this conversation and also to respond to this.